Hello everyone. Uh, today we'll talk about the cerebrum, uh, especially the cerebral cortex. Since we already talked about the gross anatomy of this part, so in this section we will focus on um, these objectives. So we will describe the uh, number of layers uh, contained in the uh, cerebral cortex. We'll talk about the function of the uh, specialized area and describe the flow of the information and the major um, major functional area. And uh, um, we also will talk about the asymmetric uh, in both uh, hemisphere and define these uh, cerebral dominance. Mm, and uh, we also will talk about the um, um, symptoms of lesions uh, to uh, some different area of this cortex. And uh, uh, there are some parts you, you may uh, use as a reference. We will talk about this uh, consciousness and sleep. In these slides, I just want to give you some big idea about the cerebral cortex. Uh, so the cerebral cortex, if you look at uh, the spaceman, you can see the cerebral cortex is in the uh, uh, superficial part and uh, it's about two to four millimeters uh, thick, but it um, contains mm, 25 billion neurons and it's a that's a very complex network because you have a lot of uh, neurons which synapse to uh, other neurons you have a lot of synapse and um, uh, this part can count nearly half that's more than 40 40 percent of the weight of the brain and it have a lot of functions because it can mediate the like voluntary motor control. You have the sensory uh, sensory area to uh, control the sensory perception. You have this uh, this lobes to responsible for the learning memory and language and also visual auditory other functions. Those things are very important for uh, as a human. The cerebral cortex is the most superficial cortex. Uh, it covers the structures we, we already um, studied, the diencephalon, the, um, the uh, basal ganglion. Uh, it covers the other parts, the relatively old part. The cerebral cortex is a, is a new uh, cortex, and uh, if we look at the, look at this uh, cerebral cortex under the microscope, it, you can see it consists of uh, six layer uh, of these cells. So we already know that the cerebral cortex can be further divided into uh, five lobes. Uh, so it includes the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and uh, the limbal lobe. And some people think that insula is also a lobe. And uh, uh, so if you look at the picture on the right side, you can see it's the uh, uh, cerebral cortex is about two to four uh, millimeters, and um, uh, the uh, the cerebral cortex includes six layers, from the superficial to deep. You have the uh, molecular lobe, external granular lobe, the external pyramidal lobe layer, the uh, internal granular layer internal pyramidal layer and the multiform layer. The upper four layers are called the supergranular layer. And they basically receive mostly sensory input 
into the first, the top four layers. So that's more important in the postcentral gyrus, which is a primary sensory cortex. Layers one to three are what you would consider non-specific sensory input coming in, like that ascending reticular activating system. So non-specific type of sensations coming in or synapsing on neurons in the first top three layers. Layer four is more specific. So that's where you're knowing exactly where the pain's located. That information is going more into that fourth layer. Layer five and layer three often contain the cell bodies of the motor neurons, especially the ones called the pyramidal neurons. It's those pyramidal neurons, the big ones you see on that fourth layer, are, their axons project to form the corticospinal, the cortical ball bar, and the cortical pontine fibers. So it's those axons that go down, form the internal capsule, and the motor fibers go through the cerebral peduncle, basal pons, and pyramids, and an 88% crust. So all of those axons are coming from the pyramidal neurons, most of them in layer five, some of them in layer three. According to the uh, current research, uh, people believe that certain patches of these cortex have the function to process certain type of information or have different function. So the function uh, like could be localized to specific area, like you have the primary motor cortex, you have the primary sensory, somatosensory cortex, you have the auditory cortex. There is a um, uh, concept that you need to know is the cortical columns. So let's picture uh, the, the uh, upper upper part will be the superficial, the super uh, surface of the cortex, and the deeper part will be the bottom part will be the white matter, the deep part of the cerebral cortex. So if you cutting through I and mean, through this sixth layer of this um, uh, cerebral cortex, uh, this all in you know, all the six layers that contribute to a specific function. So which means that uh, these six layers are responsible for like um, the same uh, sensation and uh, they organize together in columns and so we call it cortical columns and then the nearby columns can responsible for like related function closely related functions now you've seen these diagrams before with the cortex designated with different numbers. Those are called Broadman numbers or Broadman areas. Broadman was a researcher in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he analyzed histologically the cerebral cortex and he found that different areas look different histologically in terms of their cell types. So he defined these different areas with numbers, and that's what the numbers represent. Now this slide is one you have to understand because this shows you how the body is laid out in the cerebral cortex. The upper picture on the right is the postcentral gyrus and the lower one on the right is the precentral gyrus. You notice they're pretty much the same arrangement where you have at the bottom you've got the face and then the hand and then the trunk and when you get up to the top of the cerebral cortex you're around at the hip area and then extending down medially is the lower extremity. And that's how it is, whether it's the, the motor cortex, precentral gyrus, or the sensory cortex, the postcentral gyrus, it's laid out that way. So if you were to look at the bottom picture on the left and you look at the precentral gyrus, if you start at the bottom, let's look at the precentral, so that's motor, motor to the face, down to the trigeminal nerve, you know, and, uh, cranial nerve seven, for example, 
would start down there at the inferior part of the precentral gyrus. And as you moved up the precentral gyrus, you start seeing more motor neurons for the hand. And if you keep going up the precentral gyrus, now you're at the trunk and upper extremity in the trunk. And when you get to the very top of the precentral gyrus, you're kind of around the hip, so it'd be motor neurons of the hip. Now, as you look at the top picture on the left, you see the paracentral lobule. And remember, the anterior part of the paracentral lobule is an extension of the precentral gyrus. And you'll notice on the pictures on the right, what is represented on that paracentral lobule is motor neurons in the anterior part to the lower extremity. And in this case, to the contralateral lower extremity. If you look at the post Interior part of the paracentral lobule, that's sensory to the contralateral lower extremity. So the paracentral lobule has motor and sensory for the contralateral lower extremity. And your precentral and postcentral gyri are motor and sensory to the contralateral trunk and upper extremity and face. So the cortex is not just uh, divided into like um, separate functional area. Actually, uh, among these different areas, they have uh, a lot of connections. So this one just to give you some information that uh, all these areas are connected to form these uh, interconnected circuits. So the white matter um, associated with the circuits includes this uh, association fibers, its uh, commercial um, fibers, its pro projection fibers, and you can see the picture in the right side. You have this um, uh, ascending, descending, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, corpus callosum and uh, you have this um, single um, singular you can see in the inside the cingulate gyrus and you have this inferior longitudinal uh, uh, fasciculus and you have this uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus that connects to different lobe and different areas. And you can also, in the right up corner, you have this short associated fibers that connect with this uh, nearby gyrus. Uh, the cortex, uh, you, if you remember, we have this um, primary sensory, primary motor cortex. And nearby this uh, primary sensory and primary motor cortex, you have this uh, association cortex. And uh, uh, also besides this um, uh, primary and associate cortex, we have this limbic cortex. And then um, this uh, primary sensory cortex is, the function of it is to detect or aware the sensory stimuli. So they receive input from the um, thalamus. And uh, the primary motor cortex, this control, like the uh, control lateral side of your body and uh, initiate voluntary action. action. And uh, it gave rise to um, this uh, corticospinal and uh, corticobulbar tracts. The association cortex, um, it, it are usually responsible for analyzing the information from the primary cortex. It carries out high order information processing. And the limbic cortex is responsible for our emotional brain. So uh, in human brain, if you remember, we have this uh, green area in the uh, uh, human brain that is a primary motor, right? And you have the pink uh, one that is a primary sense, uh, somatosensory. And you have primary or 
primary vision area, you have primary language area, but this primary sensory or motor cortex occupied less and less of the cortex over the course of the evolution because that most of this area cortex are the association areas. Let's talk about the primary sensory cortex first. Uh, I think we already talked about when we learned the gross anatomy of the cerebral, cerebrum, and uh, this is just a review, but and also we will include the impairment uh, of the uh, uh, this this these areas. And uh, so first one will be the primary somatosensory cortex. So that include the um, um, Post-central sulcus, post-central gyrus, and um, in the parietal lobe, right? So that it's this uh, this blue area uh, that include the uh, Broadman area three, two, and one. And um, so, if this area have any lesion, uh, it will impair the ability to. Um, how to aware the uh, intensity or the localization of the sensory uh, for the contralateral side from the contralateral side. Uh, but uh, it does not typically make the sensory absent. It's just uh, lost the uh, dis discrimination of this uh, sensation. And then the second primary uh, sensory cortex will be the primary visual cortex. And you can see it located on the back of this uh, uh, occipital lobe. Uh, so uh, if this area have lesion, uh, it can cause cortical blindness in the contralateral side. Uh, and uh, the uh, third one will be the primary auditory cortex. If you remember, when we talk about the gross anatomy, a gross anatomy of the cerebral cortex, we we um, the localization of this uh, cortex is the um, on the temporal lobe. It will be the transverse temporal gyrus. If you have any uh, lesion on this area, uh, the patient will lose the ability to localize the sound, and uh, you will have minor hearing loss on the contralateral side. And uh, you also have some area that have relationship with olfactory that's also on the temporal lobe. You have the gustatory that will be on the insula, and the vestibular cortex is also on the insula. So the primary motor cortex uh, is the uh, presental gyrus in the frontal lobe. And you can see in this picture, it's labeled in the red area. And the primary motor or primary sin a sensory area and uh, it have a topographical orientation on this um, uh, primary uh, the presental and the post central uh, gyrus so that's the homunculus we already talked about so this map are distorted uh, so that highly discrimination of fine controlled part of the nervous system or the body have um, a large area space on the cortex. Uh, like for example, your fovey for the visual cortex, your fingers, your fingertips have a most sensory feeling. So it will occupy like you will have a large area of this sensory cortex. Uh, associated cortex uh, include two types, uh, 
So one is the unimodal association cortex, and another type will be the multimodal, or we can call it heteromodal model association cortex. So for the unimodal association cortex, um, usually it's um, for a single sensory or motor mod mo uh, modality. So, uh, for example, if you look at this picture, the area for in bright red, that is a primary motor cortex, right? So you can see anterior to it, you have this area six. That is uh, adjacent to this primary motor cortex. That is a premotor and the supplementary uh, motor cortex. So that is a uno, unimodal uh, association cortex for the motor cortex. And uh, uh, you can see the, um, this uh, uh, primary somatosensory cortex, that is the area 3, 1, 2, right? So posterior to it, you have this uh, um, somatosensory association area. So those are all unimodal associated cortex. Uh, the impairment for this part uh, will lead to uh, agnosia or sensation uh, without perception because this area is responsible for recognize or analyze um, the uh, motor as uh, a sensory area the sensory uh, information. Multimodal or heteromodal uh, associated cortex are uh, involved in the integrating functional. For example, like uh, the uh, posterior associated cortex can involve the vision, the auditory, or the uh, sensory um, informations and put it together and give a, a an, and do a, analyze pressing all these informations. So first the unimodal association cortex. Uh, so these cortex can include the first one will be the somatosensory associated cortex. You can see the picture in the right side from the middle side and from the lateral side. So this area includes the broad car five and six area. And uh, the function of it is to interpret or analyze the uh, somatic sensations. If you have any legend for this area, you will have this astroagnosis. Uh, and the second part, second uh, unimodal association cortex will be the visual association cortex. And you can see on the picture the, the area uh, 18 to 21, the broadcast area will be the visual association cortex. This will analyze the visual information. And uh, if you have any a legend or this area, you will have the visual agnosia. So you will know you can see things, but you don't know what it, what is it. You don't have the perception. And the, the third one will be the auditory associated area, that is in on the temporal lobe around the primary temple of the auditory cortex. So it's also like because it's 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 uh, uh, analyzed, it will analyze the auditory information. So any impairment for this area, you will have auditory agnosia, and uh, you have this uh, Wernicke area. Wernicke area is um, you didn't labeled on this um, picture. But the vernacular area is um, responsible for this language um, interpretation. It will help you understand what you hear. And uh, uh, it's on the um, superior temporal gyrus.
posterior part of this uh, superior temple gyrus. Uh, the other um, unimodal associated cortex is the um, uh, area for the primary motor cortex. Uh, this area includes the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor cortex. This area is uh, for the motor planning, motor sequencing, and uh, make motor execution. Uh, and uh, like also for the posture adjustment. So the um, impairment for this area could include the uh, limb uh, apraxia and uh, motor preservations. And uh, these uh, area also include the Brodka area. The Brodka area is for language expression. So this area is on the opacular and the triangular part of the inferior frontal gyrus. So another type of this association uh, cortex would be the multimodal association cortex. And uh, uh, it can also be called heteromodal association cortex. And uh, you can see in this picture, you have this um, green blue areas. These areas include this parietal temple association cortex. And uh, you have this dorsal, lateral, prefrontal. You have uh, medial, dorsal, prefrontal, and ventral, prefrontal. So one area is on the frontal area, frontal lobe. The posterior um, associated cortex is on the parietal and uh, temporal lobe. The patient, if you ask the patient to copy the clock or a picture, they will neglect the left side of this uh, picture because there they usually, um, the, this kind of uh, contralateral uh, neglect uh, will happen for the right uh, hemisphere, but they will neglect the left side. And also, if the patient have this area um, impaired, the patient will have this apraxia. Uh, so the apraxia is um, a neurological disorder, and uh, the patient cannot like perform a familiar movement. And even though the command is understand, and there is a willing to perform the movement, uh, but uh, the, 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 the patient just cannot execute the act. act, uh, act. And uh, this uh, especially happens in damage in the left brain. And uh, also uh, the patient will have this altered reality of the environment. The anterior multimodal associated cortex, uh, we can also call it prefrontal uh, cortex. Uh, 
and uh, the uh, responsible for this part is to for the executive functions for the motor planning in this uh, personality the foresight insight and the many of this um, uh, this uh, uh, basic aspect of the, of the personality and uh, it can include this dorsal lateral and ventral medial prefrontal cortex this uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex they receive the information the sensory data from the posterior multi multimodal association area and then integrate it and use it to um, perform this executive function and also it have um, uh, a very big very important role in the working memories so it can keep this uh, in mind and to uh, and then working on it the ventral medial prefrontal cortex these will integrate the emotions uh, you, you know, we will talk about this uh, limbic lobe in another lecture. But this um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex integrate these emotions from the limbic structures and also use it for the executive function. And uh, here's a link you can have, um, you can use as a reference to understand this part. So here is the, f the flow of the information through the whole whole uh, cerebral cortex. So first, we got information uh, from the, our body um, to the primary sensory cortex, and then it will go to this unimodal association cortex, which just to talk about, and then it composes all the sensory informations to this um, a posterior multimodal association cortex and then it's sent to the anterior side so that is the anterior multimodal association cortex so and then this area will use this information to make a decision once the decision is made the prefrontal cortex send the information to the premotor area uh, and then this area will have a motor plane then this when once this motor plane is access, assessed the premotor area uh, will send this to the primary motor uh, area and then you your primary motor uh, cortex will have um, a, a send all this um, plane to the corticospinal uh, tract to the cortical bulbar tract and then your body moved here is just uh, another picture shows you how this uh, information flowed in all this functional area so any impairment resulting from the damage of the prefrontal cortex the patient will have difficulty to combine the the cognitive strategies and uh, also have difficulty to combine these emotional reactions because it combine all these informations from the posterior side from the limbic uh, system uh, and um, to make any of this decision and plans so the patient will have this uh, apsy that is uh, lack of uh, initiative lack of goal directing behavior and the patient may have uh, uh, difficulty with working memories and uh, it, a patient can have this different uh, difficulty to choosing goals make decision or any executing planes uh, like uh, and also can have difficulty to to uh, have uh, this uh, uh, mental flexibility and uh, uh, there's a term called uh, disinhibition that is a uh, 
the inability to constrain emotion or behaviors. But uh, it will have no like little effect on intelligence. The cerebral dominance is talk about the lateralization of the brain function. So because if you look at the two hemispheres, it seems uh, symmetrical, but um, like many functions can be localized in one hemisphere. Uh, like for example, your most or most of people, they are language. Um, the cortex for the language is uh, usually located in left hemisphere. So um, the two hemispheres can be categorized as either dominant or non-dominant. So uh, what is a dominant hemisphere? Usually we think that the hemisphere with the language comprehension and production uh, is the dominant hemisphere. So in most individuals, the left hemisphere is the considered the dominant. And uh, like, uh, so for some people, um, you think the hand is may have relationship with dominance, but over 90% of the right-handed individuals are left brain dominant, but there are around 60 or 70 of the left-handed individuals are also left uh, uh, brain dominant. Besides of uh, language, uh, there are other uh, some functions uh, like think uh, lateralized in one uh, hemisphere than the other. So uh, you can see in this form in the left um, hemisphere, uh, we think these functions are related with with left hemisphere, and uh, the like spatial sensation, spatial orientation or some visual spatial analyze, we think they are dominant in the right hemisphere. So if the patient have a left hemisphere impairment, the patient uh, may have this aphasia. So the aphasia means this inability to use language usually associate with the damage to this vernica or uh, broca's area. It could be uh, damage for only one area or it can damage all these two areas. And uh, uh, traditionally divide this uh, aphasia can be divided into two types. One is this uh, non-fluent aphasia, one is this uh, fluent aphasia. People with broken uh, aphasia usually is non-fluent because this area is responsible for producing this um, language. Uh, so this patient will have very difficulty to speak out and may, may produce few words with very, with very great difficulties. And, but they don't have a problem with uh, comprehend language. And uh, the people with Wernicke aphasia typically is fluent aphasia, but uh, the sequence are like defective. So let's uh, have this difficulty comprehending language. And uh, uh, this uh, paraphasia, uh, this uh, paraphasia, usually it's this um, uh, substitution of one letter or word for another. And uh, you can have this uh, neologism that it's like the patient will like, insert a, a new or meaningless word in, in, in their uh, sentence. And uh, it can have this uh, uh, jargon aphasia, uh, 
this patient can like stringing the, together the words and the phrases in an order that like have no meaning. It's meaningless. And also, if you have this damage for both these two areas, the patient can have this global aphasia. Another thing about language is the uh, prosody. So um, the um, uh, the spoken spoken language involves an emotion uh, components. So the uh, prosody is a rhythm of or like uh, musical aspect of the uh, speech. So uh, this function is uh, typically responsible from the right hemisphere.